rejoice. I invite you to rejoice. I'm not going to make you rejoice, but I do invite you. I invite you in your homes to get up out of your seats and rejoice this morning because he's worthy. Hallelujah. Holy name, declaring 
rejoice because our God deserves the highest praise. Rejoice because he's good. Rejoice because he died for us. Let's continue to worship. Come on and say, bless the Lord.
Lord. Yes, Lord God. Yes, Heavenly Father. Yes, Lord God. Yes, Lord God. Yes, Heavenly Father. We will worship you forever because you're Lord God Almighty and there is none like you. Father, we look forward to that day when all the saints from every tribe, every tongue, every nation will be gathered around your throne, giving you glory and honor, declaring holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So Father, today receive our praise as we exalt you, as we magnify you. We love you and we honor you. And yes, we will worship you forever. Let all who agree say, amen. can we say amen again, please? Amen. amen. You may be seated. Praise his holy name. God is amazing and he is worthy to be praised. Good morning, family. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see all of you. How are you guys this morning? Praise God. Amen. <laughs> My Isha is always excited. Hallelujah. <laughs> Love her dearly. Love her dearly. My name is Tony Dunn. I'm the senior pastor here at New Day Christian Fellowship. I'm also the bishop over the New Day Global Network of Churches. And this is my wife of 37 years, Jackie Dunn. Good morning. It is such a blessing to see all of you right now. Thank you for having me. Amen. Morning. You remind me of a little nursery rhyme. You all in the places with bright, shiny faces. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning to you. Right. I don't know. I don't know. Mom, did you teach me that? Or was that some little cartoon? Or where did I get that from? Was that in school? It just came to me, huh? Where was it? At school? Okay. All right. Preschool teachers. Okay. Hallelujah. Praise God for preschool teachers. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Truly, really, truly blessed that all of you have come this morning. Amen. Amen. Especially Amen. you guys that are online. We are blessed that you're tuning in online. If you have any questions, any information you want to know, if you want to be baptized, you want to join the church, text New Day Connect at 94000. That's New Day Connect at 94000. One more time. How many zeros? <laughs> Three zeros. Three zeros. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yes, we would love to hear from you. Amen. Hey, uh, is there anybody worshiping with us for the very first time? It's your very first service at New Day. Can you lift your hand, please? This is your first time at New Day. Can you keep your hands lifted, please? Keep your hands lifted up. Welcome. Keep your hands lifted up, please. <laughs> okay. All right. Amen. 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 Our amen. ushers are giving you guys our first time guest card. Amen. Amen. Our first, ushers are giving you guys our first time guest card. And um, I'm going to ask you, please complete the card during service. At the end of service, we're going to dismiss you guys first. You'll take the completed card to our connection center. You'll be directed where to go. And there we have a special gift for you all. It's our way of saying thank you for worshiping with us at New Day this morning. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask everybody else to stand, please. You don't have to hug one another. But if you can simply turn, wave, and say, welcome to New Day. Welcome to New Day. for the word today. My, my, my. I know there was a baptism celebration and all that good stuff, but Lord, it is time for the word. And we have a treat for you today. Today, how many, I know we have some first time guests, so I'm going to explain it to you. We have five on five, but we're going to have a little bonus in there too. So we got five on five. What that means, yes, <laughs> well, we got, we have five speakers that's going to speak five minutes. We're going to be speaking on the uh, 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 Ephesians 5, I'm mean, sorry, Ephesians 4.11, where it talks about the fivefold ministry. Each, min each, past each uh, minister that's going to come up is going to represent that, uh, the uh, ministry uh, gifts that's in, the, in Ephesians 4.11. And what we have first is we have the apostle, and then we have the prophet, we have the evangelist, and we have the pastor, and we have the teacher. Now, we have speakers that are going to come for five minutes. Somebody say five minutes. Five minutes. 
Okay, I need to explain this because sometimes, you know, when you give a preacher a mic, you know, and I don't know how many of y'all been, you know, born out of the Baptist church, but when they come to a close, that close can be three different times. <laughs> when you hear that preacher say, and as we come to a close, that means another 20 minutes. <laughs> as we come to a close, that's another 15. And depending on how you're responding, as I come to a close, he finna hoop you out of the church. So we're going to give some instructions on how this is going to work today, okay? So five on five, five speakers, five minutes. Somebody say five minutes. Five minutes. All right. So the first speaker is going to come up. He has five minutes. If he gets close and get into that red zone, what we call the red zone, you're going to hear a little music from the Keys from the Oregon. That means you need to wrap it up, speakers. That means you need to come to a close. Not the 20-minute close, but the 30-second close, okay? If you happen to hit the five-minute mark and you have not closed out your sermon, you're going to hear this. Okay. If you keep going, there's a couple of things going to happen. You're going to hear all of them together. And then... And you're going to see me politely walk on the stage, grab you by your elbow, and escort you off the stage. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we got understanding, right? We got Baptist preachers in the house, and we're going to have Baptist minutes, okay? Seconds. We don't have minutes. We have seconds, all right? So let's get this thing going. We have, the bonus is, though, the bonus is we're going to bring up our very own minister, Asha, and she's going to explain the whole five-fold ministry, and then the speaker's going to come up, and they're going to come up in this order, okay? So here's the thing. I'm going to pray, and we're going to set protocol. So uh, speakers, you don't have to pray. You don't have to do none of that. You ain't got to Shabbat. You ain't got to do none of that, okay? You just come on up, read your scripture, and go right on into the Word of God. Amen? Amen. So if you have a tongue, make, it, make sure it speaks in English, okay? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. So our first speaker, I am super excited about this speaker because, you know, he the one that established and set all this stuff up. So the apostle will be represented by our own Bishop Tony Dunn. Go down, sit down, Bishop. Sit down, sit down. Anybody called you yet? Sit down. So ain't your time. Ain't your time. No, it's not your time. I, I, yeah, I, I'm just letting the people know. I'm, you know, I, can I say this? That felt good. <laughs> I'm always on the end of his jokes. <laughs> Sit down, Bishop. Amen. <laughs> Next, we're going to have Minister Minister Tracy Holcomb. She will be representing the prophets. She'll be talking about the prophets. <laughs> then we have Dr. Pat. She will be representing the evangelists. <laughs> then we'll have Pastor Brian, Pastor B, <laughs> who will be representing the pastors. And then we'll have Dr. Abraham Anasi, who will be representing the teachers. So before all of this gets started, we have our very own minister, Asha, who's going to set the atmosphere, set the tone. And right after that, each speaker would then take that order. Okay? Amen? Amen. So, Father God, how we thank you and we praise you, Lord. We thank you for each one of these men and women of God. <sighs> Let your anointing flow. Yes, Lord, we do have fun in you, Father God. So you said laughter is good for the soul, but when it comes to your word, Lord, we are serious. Five minutes can change the life of someone in this house today. So we're expecting a life-changing word today from these five speakers, Lord. So God, we say thank you. Anoint them now, Father God. Lord, anoint them right now, Father God. Let them speak 
Let the Holy Spirit speak through them, Father God, to your people. And Lord, we just give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, it says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave the church, the apostle, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. One of the core values at New Day is to equip. And by de definition, to equip means to provide someone with what they need to fulfill their purpose. But not just any purpose, a God-given purpose, a purpose that is much greater than anything you or I could ever ask or imagine. And God gives gifted leaders to the church, not for the purpose of entertaining us, not for the purpose of entertaining us, but so that every member can be equipped for the ministry. So who does God equip, church? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me give you three points in under five minutes, and then I'll take my seat so you can hear for, from our five on five. The first point is God equips the called. Chances are the pressure of having a good job, an impressive resume, and a successful business have convinced many of you that you are not equipped until you have checked off the boxes. But what if you were told that being equipped has nothing to do with a resume? or a good job, or a marriage? What if you were told that all it takes to be equipped is to simply say yes to Jesus? Over and over again, we see God calling ordinary people to do extraordinary things, okay? You don't believe me. First, Moses, a man living in the desert who was considered to be a failure, went on to lead a nation to freedom. Second, David, a shepherd boy who was looked down upon, went on, went on to defeat an oversized warrior. And third, Peter, an ordinary fisherman who struggled with identity, went on to lead the church after Jesus' resurrection. These stories make it clear that a calling from God always precedes the competency of man. You see, God didn't choose these people because they were expected to do what they ultimately accomplished. He chose them because he knew they were, they, were they were capable of being obedient and faithful to the plan that he had for their lives. Being equipped has nothing to do with your skill set. Being equipped has nothing to do with your skill set, but everything to do with your obedience to the Lord. If you could do it on your own, it wouldn't be God's call. It would be your call. Let me say it again for the people in the back. If you could do it on your own, it wouldn't be God's call. It would be your call. All right, I don't have time. Here's my second point. God equips the confident. What if you were told that confidence isn't built in how you think of yourself, but instead in how you think of God? There's a saying that says, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. You see, true confidence does not come from the outside world. It comes from a personal relationship with the creator of the universe. Paul spent a large amount of time writing about the redemption, love, and purpose that comes with following Christ, all while being in prison. <laughs> he didn't have confidence because of his occupation, situation, or reputation. He had confidence because he knew who he belonged to. And someone in here needs to be reminded of who you belong to. No, you don't belong to that man. No, you don't belong to that job. You belong to the Most High God. God equipped Paul to reach thousands, not because Paul was in the best situation, but because Paul was confident and who he belonged to. And my last point, God equips the commissioned. And to be commissioned means to be sent out to fulfill a particular purpose. You see, we were created for a purpose, but that purpose goes far beyond our money, our education, or our occupation. Our purpose lies in a few commands that Jesus gives us before he ascends to heaven. Okay, so I hear you. You're saying, but Asha, I'm not qualified to spread the word. But let me assure you, Christ died for all of your doubts, all of your fears, and all of your sins so that you could tell the people about his 
goodness. So today, what I want you to do is I want you to move forward knowing that God will equip you to go wherever he has called you to go, wherever he has needed you to go. God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We will move forward knowing that we are equipped in the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, I just realized, please never put me behind Asha again. <laughs> the office of the apostle. In the ancient Greek world, apostolos is a word, but it was an admiral of a fleet sent out by the king on special assignment. Now, in the Bible, there are two sets of apostles, okay? There was Jesus' 12 who laid the foundation with the prophets from the Old Testament. And then there was a subset of apostles in which they're, they're God called, Jesus called them to go out and spread the gospel. But today, we're going to talk about one particular apostle, the apostle Paul, whose name previously was Saul, okay, and who came on the scene about seven years after Jesus. These are, seven, these are four traits of apostles right here. Apostles are sent out by the Holy Spirit. Apostles go from place to place. Apostles establish churches. Apostles strengthen believers. Acts 9.15, when Paul was introduced to his calling, the Lord Jesus said, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take. Say to take. There's some taking when you are an apostle. Take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. Acts 13, 14, we see this being manifested here. Acts 13, 4, it says, So Barnabas and Saul, who later was to become Paul, were sent out. Say sent out. Yeah. Apostles are sent out. So you understand why me and Jackie constantly go, okay? Uh, they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. Go with me, please, to Acts 15, 36. And it says this about the apostles. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back. Say go back. Go back. Bishop, why have you been to Africa 25 times? Because the Bible says to go back. Let us go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord. So when you say, Bishop, why are you going there again? Because the scriptures tell me to. Yeah, come on. To see how. What I'm going to do to see how the new believers are doing. Let's go, go to Acts 15, 41, please. Then he, being Paul, traveled throughout Syria and Cilicia. What did he do? Strengthening the churches there. Acts 16, 4 and 5, it says, then they went from town to town. So we will be later on this year, we will be in Poland. We will be in Serbia. We will be in North Macedonia. We will be in Zambia. We will be in Uganda. We will be in the Philippines. We will be in Brazil. And from town to town, what are we going to be doing? Instructing the believers to follow the decisions made by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. Verse 5, so the churches were strengthened in their faith, and it grew larger every day. Acts 18, 23. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul went back through Galatia and Phrygia. What did he do? Visiting and doing what? Strengthening all the believers. Now, Paul finally made it to a king. Let's see his testimony to the king about his calling. Acts 26, 17 through 18 says this, Jesus speaking to him, and I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Sometimes your own people be tripping. Your own people be giving you a hard time because of their ignorance of your calling. They think they got it figured out. They think because they've been in church for a little while. They think their denomination is the one. They got a lockdown on Christianity. No, no, not at all. I'm going to save you from your own people. Yes, I am sending you. Say sending you. Sending you. To the Gentiles. Verse 18. The reason I'm sending you, Paul, is to open their eyes. You think you can see. Open their eyes so that they may return from darkness to light. I see so many people in darkness, and just because you can get around in darkness, you think you can see. You can't see. You don't know how ignorant you are, how, uh, how, how unspiritual you are. To turn you from darkness to light and from the power or authority of Satan to God. You don't even know when you're operating under the power of Satan. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. So how does this take place? Who is the funness? You ever wonder how did Jesus go about all three and a half years with 12 grown men feeding him? You ever wonder about how Paul got around? Glad you asked. Go, to, go with me, please, to Romans 15, 24. Romans 15, 24. Paul is in the city of Corinth. 
with the church in Corinth. And watch what he does. He writes a letter to the church in Rome. Look what he says here in verse 24. I am planning to go to Spain, and when I do, I will stop off in Rome. And after I've joined your fellowship for a little while, you can provide for my journey. So New Day, you can provide for my journey. Apostles again, they're sent out by the Holy Spirit. They go from place to place. They establish churches, and they strengthen believers, and that was under five minutes. <laughs> and don't put me after Bishop again. <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm here to talk about the office of the prophet. Hmm. The description of the prophet is this. The office of the prophet is specifically ordained by God directed by God's divine appointment, not my own, but by God's divine appointment, and communicates clearly what God intends to say. A prophet is one who receives supernatural revelation and speaks by divine authority and inspiration. Some of the functions and the traits and the characteristics of a prophet are they, they usually operate from a higher realm uh, than any normal um, ministry. Prophets uh, have a tendency of seeing into the supernatural or, and seeing to the realms where other people can't see. So it gives them the ability to uh, function as they need to function in the body of Christ, as they are a gift to the body of Christ. Yeah. Prophets are not here to usurp the authority of the apostle. We fall under the, uh, under the apostle. We're here to help e build, build equip and bring forth the body of Christ to the bridegroom, and that's Jesus. So the characteristics of a prophet, you must be holy. You must be filled with the Holy Spirit, or you will not hear what the Lord is speaking to the prophet. The prophet's purpose is to edify and exhort and, con and, and consult. Some of, the, some of the revelation of supernatural gifts of the prophet are word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and discerning of spirits and prophecy. A prophet must be able to discern spirits, especially in the church, especially when they walk into the church, because a demon will wreak havoc in the church. And the prophet is set into the church as a watchman, as a gatekeeper. And a prophet is not uh, 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 blinded by the spirits, the demonic spirits that come into the church and have no problem help delivering them out. Thank you, Jesus. And prophets are obedient. If you're not obedient to your pastor, or you're not obedient to the bishop, if you're not obedient to the leadership, sit down till you get obedience. Something I had to learn early. Thank you, Jesus. The, cons uh, the prophet is uh, compassionate. God is still working on me. They reveal consequences, truth tellers, they're intercessors, and like I said, filled with the Holy Spirit and has an intimate relationship with God. Yeah, come on. Mm. Because prophets are the mouthpiece, mouthpiece of God, they must follow God's protocol when speaking or giving a word. Prophets are obedient to God's voice and should only speak when released by God to do so. Timing is everything in giving a word. If you give a word too early, it will cause confusion. If you give a word too late, you've missed it. You've missed it. You missed the opportunity to bless someone. That's why timing is, is delicate to a prophet. We must move when God tells us to move. It's extremely important. Prophets are aware that, are, that they are God's gift to the church, not to themselves. We don't false prophesy, we're not mediums. We don't uh, 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 come to uh, obey, prophesy, prophesy, papa, prophesy. That's out of order with God. Hallelujah. Prophets prophesy when God gives them the, the, the words to speak. Prophets must be consecrated. Prophets must have a prayer and fasting life so they can maintain the presence of God in their lives. Failure to do so will result in the prophet not being able to accomplish the purpose for which they are created. And this is just, uh, I'm going to get to Agabus. 
Agabus in Acts chapter 21 and 10, he was a prophet sent to the apostles. He, he, he had the apostles' companionship. So Agabus gave warning to Paul how they were going to bind Paul and, and, and how they were going to do him when he went into the next city. So prophets bring warning. Prophets bring warning to the church. Prophets bring warning to the people. And another note, uh, just because one can prophesy does not mean they are called to the office of prophet. God calls and equips. Jeremiah 1 and 5, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you appoint, apart, appointed, set, and, set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. So I conclude with this. God is very sensitive about his prophets. It is the only ministry of which he makes the emphatic declaration by my prophets, do my prophets no harm, Psalms 105, 15. Amos 3 and 7 says, makes it very clear. Indeed, the sovereign Lord never does anything until he reveals his plans to his servants, the prophets. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord, the evangelist. How many of you are saved? You wouldn't have been without the evangelist. <laughs> Growing up, when I was 14 years old, in the slums of Nairobi, we used to hold a microphone and go and preach the gospel. We were children. We didn't know the gospel. All we did was to say, you get saved or go to hell. People came. We led them to Christ. And if you want people to get saved, send children. Because they have no boundaries. Who is an evangelist? An evangelist comes from the Greek word, yogelion, which means good news. It is the only office you don't need to be trained. Just do it. <laughs> Win people to Christ. Hallelujah. I'm going to talk about Andrew. When I was give, when I was giving birth to my son, the Lord said, what do you want to name him? I said, Andrew. God said, why? Because I want him to win people for Christ. How many of you know Andrew? Very few. Why? Because nobody talks about Andrew, but everybody talks about Paul and Peter. Let's go to the book of John chapter 1, verse 40 to 41. Simon Peter was a brother to Andrew. Jesus came and preach and wanted to we, to bring uh, his disciples. And Andrew said, ran to Peter and said, I have seen the Messiah. Come and see the Messiah. Do you know without Andrew, you would not have Peter, Simon Peter? Andrew the evangelist brought Peter. And Peter is the foundation of the apostolic church. So without Andrew, no Peter. The evangelist leads his family to Jesus Christ. The evangelist have a deep insight and faith. John 6, 8. Jesus comes in to feed the 5,000. Everybody knows that. Jesus looks at the people and says, can somebody go and buy bread? Somebody. Philip. Philip and Andrew, they were always together. They were buddies. Philip says, we can walk the whole time, but we have no money. To buy for bread for all these people. Jesus did say, can you give me money? He said, where is bread? And Andrew had the insight. There is a boy. There's five loaves of bread. And from that boy, Jesus took the bread and fed the 5,000. An evangelist has an insight to see the heart of God. When you understand the deep heart of God, you are able to sense what he wants so that when you're delivering the message, deliverance come. His job is to take the bread and give it to Christ. And Christ does the work. That is the evangelist. John chapter 12, verse 20 to 22. An evangelist has no boundaries. The Greeks came and said, sir, we want to meet Jesus. We know that the Greeks, the Samaritans, they were not friends with the Jews. Racism didn't start now. It started in the Bible. You stay there. We stay here. We are the Jews. We carry the Bible. We have the Torah. 
You don't. So the Greeks come, and they're like, we want to meet Jesus. Philip says, hey, Andrew, tell the, Jesus. Why didn't Philip lead the Greeks to, the, to Jesus? Why did he tell Andrew? Because evangelists have no boundaries. Bishop just stood here and said he's an apostle. I think he's an evangelist. Evangelists will go to, how many of you have gone to Zambia? Okay, just look. One person. Why? Evangelists have no boundaries. They will go to Zambia. They will go to Ecuador. I remember Jim Elliot in 1954. I love that man. Him and his, you know, they were young men. Him and Saint and the rest, there were five of them. They went to Ecuador to preach among the, the Wondani. They are called the Wondani today, but they were Oka people. And when they preached the gospel, they were speared and killed. They, they were all killed. And when the last spear fell on Jim Elliot from Mankai, when Mankai, who is an Wawondani, killed Jim Elliot, Jim said, I have the gun, but I cannot shoot you for the sake of the gospel. Evangelists will die for the gospel. The Bible says that we preach this gospel in and out without any season. And so when he preached the gospel, his wife, Elizabeth went back into the Wondani people and continued the work. There is no boundaries with the evangelist. When it comes to the gospel, the evangelist will go anywhere at any time and win people for Christ. That is the evangelist. I'm like, wait a minute, there's no confusion in the church. What are we doing? <laughs> exactly. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I wanted to tell you, almost 10 years ago, there was a young girl that was actually a part of this church. And uh, she eventually graduated and she left. She actually hit me up just a few months ago. Um, I was trying to pull up the message exactly because I wanted to read it because it was so true to her heart. But I wanted to let you know that she messaged me just out of the blue, and she wanted me to really be sure I knew that the work that I had done for her specifically, when she was a part of our youth ministry here at this church, she said she never forgot it. She had gone astray a little bit here and there, but today that she is married, she has a child, and she is taking her family to church, and they are serving God. And she wanted me to know that it was because I pastored her. I don't know where exactly it came from. I do believe that that gift is in the womb, that the calling of God comes from when you are in the womb, and that as you step forth, God is already going to nurture and do the things to be able to get you into that position, and particularly as a pastor. Now, my father helped me to really see that, because yes, I cared for people, and yes, I just seemed to have this heart, I'm not sure, I, I guess I'm, it's just me and my grandmother who have this heart, I guess, um, in the Dunn family, as so he says. <laughs> Maybe my uncle too. Right, right. Um, but um, my dad helped me see it because he sat me down and he's like, I want you to look at this fivefold ministry. And it's just oozing right out of you. Do you see it? Do you see it? And maybe I was just being humble. Maybe I was just, I don't know. But he was like, look at this. And right there, it was pastor. He's like, that's what you do. It's instinctive for you. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it says, Take care and be on guard for yourselves and for the whole flock over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers, to shepherd, tend, feed, and guide the church of God which he brought, bought with his own blood. I know that after I am gone, false teachers like ferocious wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, even from among you, your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse and distorted things to draw away the disciples after themselves as their followers. Paul writes this to the church leaders in Ephesus, and he then writes the letter of Ephesians to that church to explain the office exactly. That's what we heard in Ephesians chapter 4. And he called some pastors, 
to be pastors, to equip the saints. So with this verse that we just read, this is how you will know a shepherd from a wolf. Because there is a distinction here, and he wants to be sure you know that distinction. Because it's all about who are they leading you toward. Because does their word cause you to want to know Christ, or is it to cause you to want to know them and follow them? Because who are you actually following based on the word of the shepherd in which you follow? It's funny, my Instagram bio, I wrote this a while, but um, you know, people always talk about their followers and this. My Instagram bio literally says, don't follow me. It says that, don't follow me, follow Christ. Because I'm serious about it, I'm serious. A pastor needs to be so close to Jesus, he knows exactly where to lead them. In John 10, it talks about the parable of the good shepherd, in which the sheep are guided by the shepherd into the sheepfold. And Jesus describes himself as the door to the sheep, to the sheepfold. And so for us pastors, we are to lead the sheep into the sheepfold, right to Christ, exactly where he is. And it says his sheep know his voice. So as pastors, we are echoes. We are echoes of the very thing that Jesus is saying so that when the people are hearing us, they hear Christ. And it's not just an echo of voice, but it's an echo of love. It's an echo of posture. It's an echo of the things that Jesus does. If your pastor does not look like Jesus, what's described in the word, uh, mm, I would check that. So, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 through 3, I want to share that real quick. It says, Therefore I strongly urge the elders among you, pastors, spiritual leaders of the church, as a fellow elder and as an eyewitness called to testify of the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd and guide and protect the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not motivated for shameful gain, but with wholehearted enthusiasm, not lording it over those assigned to your care. Do not be arrogant or overbearing, but be examples of Christian living to the flock. Set a pattern of integrity for your congregation. That's exactly what a pastor needs to do. A pastor needs to tend, to feed, to guard, and to lead. And apart from that, that is not a pastor. A pastor will tend, a pastor will feed according to what you need, a pastor will guard and protect. You have no idea how many times Bishop has protected this flock from people who wanted to come, but said, nah, 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 nah. This is God's sheep right here. And ultimately, his sheep know his voice. So if you follow Christ, you are to allow a shepherd to do those things. And I'm done. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to talk about the teacher. Let's all say understanding and application. Understanding and application. We, we are living in the world of social media. We are living in the world of fake news. We are living in the world where there is no truth. People lie to your face and people have been lied to by politicians. And sometimes we look for truth from wrong places. You will never find any truth from newspapers. And we go to different places looking for, for truth. Jesus said something in John chapter 8, verse 32. He says, you, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The purpose of the teacher is to help us know the truth. Because it's only the truth that can set us free. It's only the truth that can set sinners free. It's only the truth that can help us in our lives. Because there are so many lies all over the world. There are so many lies about God, lies about the church, lies about family, lies about Christianity. So many lies all over. 
And God gave us teachers so that they can teach us the truth. Because it is only the truth that can set us free. So the teachers, they help us understand the word of God. The purpose of the teacher, every time you see the teacher come up front, his purpose is to help you understand the word of God. It is possible to read the word of God and you do not understand it. You remember in the book of Acts chapter 8, verse 31, and, I mean from verse 31 to, to 32, we find a situation where there was Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. He was reading, but he was not understanding what he was reading. He was reading from the book of Isaiah. And he asked uh, Philip, he says, was, was this, was this uh, prophet, was he talking about himself or was he talking about somebody else? And Philip says, he was talking about Jesus. And he started to explain. But something very interesting. Philip asked him, do you understand what you are reading? And he says, how can I understand without a teacher? How can I understand without somebody explaining to me the meaning of what I'm reading? The purpose of the teacher is to help us understand the word of God. But also the purpose of the teacher is to help us apply the word of God. James says, it is not the hearer of the word, but it's the doer of the word who is, who is blessed. It is not enough to come to church and feel good and have a good service. No, no. We need good theology. And it's only the teacher who can teach us the word of God, who can teach us good theology and apply the word of God. It is, you know, the word of God, the Bible, it's not for our information. The Bible, it's for our transformation. It is not enough just to know the Bible and, and, and somebody comes and you jump. And, but at the end of the day, you go back and live like an unbeliever. We have to move from just knowing to doing. God will bless us when we apply the principles of the word of God. I love Bishop Tony because he talks about the reality of life, how to apply the word of God in our day-to-day -day living, how to apply the word of God from Monday to Saturday, how to apply the word of God in our homes, how to apply the word of God in our jobs, and that is the purpose of the teacher. Remember, the main purpose of the teacher, it's two things, understanding and application. And teachers have a motto or a slogan. Their slogan is, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. We pray that you are blessed by our worship experience. Now, this is the part in the service where you can participate through your giving. Here at New Day, we have three ways to give. First, you can text us. Text New Day Corona to 77977 and follow the instructions in your text message. Or you can visit us online. Visit newdaycorona.org and click the giving tab. Lastly, you can mail your gift to 1114 West Ontario Avenue, Corona, California, 92882. Here at New Day, we also have an offering confession. Let's declare it together. Father, we honor you as we present to you your tithes and our offerings. You are the authority over all we have. We give an obedience to you, O God, who causes all grace to abound towards us. For we have sufficiency in all things and abundance for every good work. There is no lack in our lives. For we give to the poor and support the work of missionaries. Therefore, as we sow our financial seed, we thank you for the harvest of wisdom to manage our financial affairs, financial favor, oil and mineral rights, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits and promotions, favorable settlements and rebates, the return of what's lost or stolen, scholarships and grants, increased sales and commissions, the miracle of debt cancellation, favorable financial surprises, every bill and every debt paid. We declare that we not only have enough, but we have more than enough. We declare that we have enough to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the whole earth. For we are blessed to be a blessing, and we will care for the widows and orphans. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, my soul.